Welcome one and all to Last Stop Penn Station podcast featuring Carrie Silken and Ian Riccoboni. They dive deep into Carrie's wealth of stories and no subject is off limits. From the world of wrestling to his ticket agency, growing up in New Jersey, drug-fueled underground days, hustling in the French Quarter of New Orleans, and endless days and nights in New York City, every story is worth telling. Welcome, everyone, once again to Last Stop Penn Station, Ian Riccoboni and the guest of honor, Carrie Silken. Carrie, Show World was a hit last week. Ah! <laughs> Lamb Chop loves Lamb it, Lamb Chop's in the house. They, <laughs> Lamb Chop would not approve of Show World, but Show World was a hit. Um, how could it not be? I mean, imagine that it remained, as we said last week, in, its, uh, in action for uh, close to... Half a century. Amazing. What a legacy, right? Yes. And uh, I wonder how Misty Wet's doing. <laughs> Do you think, okay, when when we got done recording, I was wondering, you know how, you know, if you go to Disney World, there's a different person in the Mickey Mouse costume. Was Misty Wet always Misty Wet? Or do you think, you know, they trotted in Lady, you know, Lady A, Lady B, Lady C. There's just different Misty Wets. I'm, I'm sure they did. And I'm sure they had other... Uh, main events in, in the furry beaver room. <laughs> a wind-up, as as we call the... Uh, yeah, so if it wasn't Misty Wet, there might have been, you know, uh, good old fuckface Francis coming in. Jeez. Or, yeah. or someone, of the, someone of that ilk. Um, and I think you asked me this, and I answered incorrectly. I think they did have some... Uh, just like, you know, go-go bars would advertise uh, these uh, centerfold types. Oh, like guest celebrities or guest Correct. dancers at clubs now. Right. right. And, uh, yeah, so I think they had some of the uh, uh, women of porn that maybe were on the decline. Mm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was a good episode. Um we got some good feedback and there was a lot of good. There's been a lot of good feedback continuing with uh, Ring of Honor. Absolutely. Ring of Honor. We're on a roll right now. Uh, this week's episode saw Shane Taylor and Kenny King, SOS and the Briscoes. And the big announcement as of uh, Tuesday on our OH week by week final battle is December 18th. Yes, December 18th. And I saw because of. The horrible attack on Quinn McKay. Yeah. What a what a tragedy. Yeah. A nice girl like her. Yeah. And Mandy. I thought she was yeah. my friend. I mean yeah, turning her back on yeah, yeah. I don't know if you can let's continue to associate with her, Carrie. Well uh it did you know one door we we I, we often talk about the Ring of Honor history and you know guys would leave mm-hmm. and it gives people opportunities. So uh, this is an unfortunate thing with Quinn McKay, but it gave you an opportunity, right, to come back in the week to week. Yeah, I host it week by week. You could check it out and uh, had a fun segment. Anytime I fill in for Quinn, I do the. Uh, I do between Ian's ears. So if you ever wonder what quotes and what the uh, if it sounds familiar, that's where things come from. And uh, I learned a lot because I did watch that. And uh, I didn't know that you had, you know, um, some of our listeners, you know, some of the ones I'm friends with, uh, my friend Beverly and uh, Disgustin Dustin, (laughs) who's going to we have some stories about him. We haven't even gotten to them yet, but. Uh, and other other people I know that know us are always saying that they know me, but they not necessarily know you. And they're always praising your um, you're very well versed, not just in pro wrestling, but in <clears throat> excuse me, in music, politics. And so what I learned from what is it between your ears? Yeah, between Ian's ears. <laughs> well, between your ears, I didn't know that you had. Because it's not my it's not my milieu, but this uh, hip hop yeah. rap uh, 
um, knowledge that you uh, garnered from your uh, brother. Yeah, my brother's eight years older than I am. So he was the perfect age in that first wave, of, maybe second wave of hip hop with NWA, Cypress Hill, Houdini. Um, I remember the tapes, the records, and then the CDs yeah, later. Uh, one of my funniest memories is going into, it used to be called Wall to Wall Music, and my mom trying to surprise my brother asking for old dirty bastards record and, <laughs> and seeing the reaction because that was at the time when you didn't just have anybody working at the store. You, you needed somebody that knew music that had an idea of the catalog and of what was coming in and what was hot. It was before Google. You had the big book in the front or the back of the store that told you what was kind of available. And uh, to hear my mom, who was probably about 35, 40 at the time, asked for old dirty bastard. <laughs> she didn't call him ODV? No, she didn't. So that's one of my favorite memories as a kid. Well, I give you credit because personally, you know, I was raised by my by my mom with a great, although I wouldn't admit to it, with a great appreciation of jazz and classical. Mm -hmm. She loved you know uh cool jazz like you know the the big bands you know you had your glenn miller and tommy dorsey they were like uh, middle you know they were like uh, uh very vanilla yeah then you had duke ellington and count basie and she had the 78s oh. she, she had you know she had billy Ho you know she turned me on billy holiday mm -hmm. you know this famous strange fruit yeah uh, you know she played that for me and she also had a great love of Broadway musicals. Taking me uh, to see some shows as a kid, I saw Fiddler on the Roof with Zero Mostel. Wow. And uh, maybe you've heard of this, maybe you haven't, The Man of La Mancha. Mm -hmm. And uh, I forget who the star was. And uh, there was another, oh darn, ooh, what the heck was it? Uh, Pippin. Oh, okay, yeah. And uh, seeing some of these great Broadway shows, but where I'm, and then I had a love of pop music through through my cousin Mike, and uh, I was listening to AM radio at like the age of uh, eight years old. I remember the Beatles the first time that they were on Ed Sullivan. Yeah. And my uncle Frankie had that record store, so I would I would get these forty fives, and then through Mike. Uh, he told me about this newfangled thing. I'm like, what's that? He goes, it's FM radio. I go, ooh, what's that? <laughs> he goes, he goes, you know, it's, it's just like a whole nother band. So my dad being the good dad that he did, that he was, uh, got me an AM FM radio. So I was listening at 11, 12, 13 years old to the New York freeform rock stations, giving me my love of... Uh, these great rockers, you know, hearing the Who and Hendrix and all the other ones. But I, but where I'm going with it, and I liked Motown, mm -hmm. and I liked some some good uh, soul uh, to James Browns mm -hmm. and and uh, Ike and Tina Turner. Yeah. But as I got older, and the hip hop revolution we'll call it or even the punk i never i i i sort of turned my back on it yeah. and as far as uh rap hip-hop um i really never gave it a chance as to where guys your age and aj uh it was it was in your wheelhouse whether you liked it or not so mm -hmm. uh it's good to, it's good to be exposed to all types of music it is i think as a young man, what made me simultaneously uncomfortable, but also really like rap and hip hop was a lot of the earlier stuff that came out in the later 70s, early 80s. There's a lot of uncomfortable truths <laughs> that we talked about, you know, and we talked about those when we were talking about uh, everything that was going on with Black Lives Matter and the, the protests in Minnesota and across the country. And I think that's a a deal breaker was at the time prohibiting it from being an even bigger success than it was. I mean, the first hit record, first hit rap record was was Blondie and it had to take a, a white woman doing rap to make it a hit. Well, I was going to say, 
you're 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 spot on with Blondie. But um, I remember, I don't remember the year, but it was in that early '80s time period when Grandmaster Flesh, uh-huh. they were from the Bronx, right? Yeah. And uh, was the title of the song? Uh, I know the line, don't push me. Oh, the message. The, the message, yeah. that's it. And uh, including the great Flavor Flav, yeah. right? <laughs> I remember going with Dustin to the uh, to the Yankee Met World Series in 2000 or 2001. Mm-hmm. And uh, Flavor Flav was like a, a row or two in front of us or behind us. And he still had the giant, <laughs> the giant clock <laughs> on, the, on the chain, you know? But... Uh, Point is, is that you have. Uh, I learned today that, uh, which I never knew, that not only are you a rock and roller, but you have a good knowledge of uh, hip hop slash rap, and that's a good thing. <laughs> oh, I, I do my best to stay to stay well versed. Uh, I can't rock the fashion though. The Yellow Cool J had that cool Kangol hat. <laughs> hey, you, you wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to to pull that off. Well. Uh, your fashion sense is pretty good. I'm still disappointed you didn't wear the white rimmed glasses. I'll have to show AJ a picture of that. I know a lot of our listeners know what I'm talking about that are Ring of Honor fans. Um, hey, what a surprise. Um, I got a, we got a message from a gentleman named Michael Kaplan. Michael Kaplan, that's right. And he writes for the New York Post. Yes. And um, at first I'm like, who's this guy? And Ian's a great co-host and a, and a great guy to have on your team because instead of me just saying, ah, this must be some bogus message because he uh, direct messaged me on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And uh, last night, Ian's like, Carrie, you, you got to call this guy. Um, I said, I didn't think he was legit. He goes, no, he's legit. He's legit. So I called Michael Kaplan and Michael Kaplan writes for the New York Post amongst other publications. Well, there's a John Bellucci special coming to Showtime. Oh, wow. Um, it's within it's either this weekend or next next weekend. So Michael Kaplan was given the duty to do a story uh, about the special. But. As I was saying to AJ before uh, you got here, anybody can just see a preview of it mm-hmm. and talk about it. But he wanted some extra material. Yeah. And that's where he came across our great episode from Last Stop Penn Station on John Bellucci and uh, my interactions with him. So I went over it with him. Um, it's going to be hopefully uh, this Sunday in the post, uh, in the paper and mm-hmm. online. So, uh, shout out to Michael Kaplan and, uh, I'll be interested to uh, check that out and I'll be interested to also see the documentary. Yeah. no, oh, that sounds great. And, uh, I'm curious to see if your experience was, was uniform with, uh, with others because our mutual friend, Chris Freed, uh, is friends with Chevy Chase's daughter has met Chevy a few times. And the reputation that Chevy has is kind of being hard headed is not what Chris's experience. So I'm wondering if maybe uh, you've got a different side of John or if maybe he was always if he was always that aggressive or always that in character. That was one of the questions that uh, Michael asked me. Mm-hmm. Uh, did, did I uh, fancy continuing to do business with him. <laughs> and I'm saying, no. <laughs> no. Uh, you know, yeah, even if he might have been a, a fabulous customer, he was just uh, so rude and uh, unpleasant that uh, it, it went beyond any kind of money. Um, but yeah, so uh, that was nice that uh, our podcast... Uh, we're able to contribute to this and uh, we appreciate Michael Kaplan uh, getting hold of us. So uh, 
look at the New York Post this Sunday, kids. Yeah. Or look online if nothing else. I asked him, does anyone read the paper anymore? <laughs> he says, I don't know. <laughs> well, New York Post has been good to us. They uh, they did a feature on me, of all people, before Madison Square Garden. There you which go. Which very nice. And uh, they they cited me as NYU first baseman Ian Riccoboni, <laughs> which is the last time anybody's ever referred to my baseball career. <laughs> first and only. Uh, and before we get into the topic today, which is Mick Foley, and it's going to be a two-parter on Mick Foley's introduction to Ring of Honor and uh, the time he spent and your personal relationship with Mick. Um, we got a listener comment from Ghost of Quinones on Twitter. Oh, really? Yeah. So the ghost, the ghost of Victor Quinones is, is speaking to us. Uh, so just listen to your latest podcast, podcast with Carrie. Please ask him if he was a devotee of Al Goldstein's Screw Magazine. <laughs> Are you familiar with Screw Magazine? And Absolutely. Yeah, okay. And I believe it might still be published. Yeah, I, I think so. I don't know if Al Goldstein's alive. Um, yeah, we'll have to look that one up and get back. But Was I a devotee? Um, let's put it this way. Pre-internet, <laughs> uh, we're talking 70s, 80s. And into the, even the 90s, they had great classified section. <laughs> okay. Yeah, all right. So if you were looking for uh, some kind of – first of all, Screw Magazine, in case people don't know, was it was a, a newspaper, like a tabloid. Mm-hmm. It was printed in New York, and it was just dedicated to – Sex in the sex industry. Okay. They would review the latest porn uh, that would come out. They would uh, have interviews. And um, it was New York based. So the advertising were the porn theaters. Mm -hmm. And... Some of the great, uh, you know, the show world, I'm sure show world had a standing deal <laughs> right. as well as the Adonis all male theater yeah. and these other institutions. But um, the the classifieds, you know, they had the hookers mm. um, of, of all uh, any preference, you know, girls, men, uh, trans, transgender, whatever, yeah. whatever you wanted. Wow. And uh so this was like Backpage or Craigslist before Oh yeah. Backpage and Okay. And it was printed every week. Really? Yeah. And I uh I used the service a couple times. Okay. And um it was handy. How much did it how much did it run? The quarter? The oh the paper? Yeah. I think they charged you know, they charge over the price that okay. would be uh normally charged because of what it was. Yeah. Let's say a magazine uh, you know, a uh, Village Voice at the time might have been uh, 50 cents. You know, Screw Magazine might have been like two bucks. Oh, OK. Because, you know, it was a specialty item. Yeah. And there were probably some other ones. Mm-hmm. But that was like the New York Times. Right. <laughs> well, uh, what was the um, what was the music tabloid that they're not tabloid, but uh, Village Voice was one. There, well, there was, there of course, other... Mike G with the Aquarian. Right. East Coast Rocker. Yeah. And um there were some other secondary ones, but yeah, Screw Magazine was, uh, uh, and I think still is. I'm going to look it up. Okay. You know, it's very interesting. Um, and the Village Voice also would have, um, although they didn't, they might have had escorts, but they they definitely had the ads from the uh, the uh, theaters that showed the porn. Okay. And um it was uh, it was just a different time. Yeah. So uh, interesting stuff. Yeah. Great question. Thank you so much, Ghost of Quinones. Yes. <laughs> yes. V- Victor. Uh, Victor was something. So go back if you if you're wondering what we're talking about. Subscribe to Last Stop Penn Station and go back to the episodes about when I was in Puerto Rico trying to do a wrestling magazine and dealing with. Uh, he was really brilliant. You know, mm-hmm. but, you know. Think of Victor Quinones, uh, being born in Puerto Rico, speaking uh, fluent English, fluent Spanish. I know he might be his dad might be allegedly Gorilla Monsoon's son, according to the New York Times. But at right, and what amazes me is that he was a besides you know the whole allegedly uh, could he have been part of the Bruiser Brody thing? We don't know, mm-hmm. but. Uh, then going 
to Japan. Yeah. And speaking fluent Jap- I don't know how- Amazing. <laughs> right. Speaking fluent Japanese and going when wrestling was in sort of a dead period in the 90s, uh going to Japan and what was it? F FMW. Uh, right. And um interesting cat, that's for sure. Yeah. Amazing. R.I.P. Victor. R.I.P. Victor. But hello to Mick, because that's who we're talking about today, Mick Foley. Yeah, and it's funny. Uh, who they crossed paths, I think, in FMW, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that's sort of where the story is. Well, the story is, I'll give you a little, uh, my history as a fan of, of Mick Foley. Mm-hmm. When uh, Cactus Jack... You could correct me if I'm wrong. I believe uh, Cactus Jack was his first real wrestling. Uh, right. And the first time he had a big national break was about 89 in, in, in the NWA. He, he had an enhancement match. He turned on his partner. And that's kind of how they. OK. They got their, he got his kind of national start ish. I remember reading about him and, you know, Dave Meltzer's Wrestling Observer. Okay. And it was interesting. And then getting to see him on that global show. Right. So he was in G. <laughs> He's got a wild timeline where he goes, he does that. He's kind of breaks free, does some freelance stuff with the Herb Abrams UWF. And that's the first time I got to see him live. You were at a Herb Abrams show. Yes. Okay. Herb Abrams. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Herb Abrams. Uh, the wild man that he how did he die? Uh, he died allegedly uh, naked, covered in baby oil, in an office with an escort with either mounds of depending on the story, either mounds of cocaine or cocaine on the baby oil on his person. <laughs> okay, so depending on which account of it, allegedly. Well, when he had his wrestling company, what was it called? The, uh, U- the UWF, which was also the name that existed th- only three years prior with Bill Watts. Right. Yeah. So. He didn't really do that many shows, but there was a couple times he ran um, the Pennsylvania Hotel, the one that's directly across from Madison Square Garden. Mm-hmm. So we're talking 7th Avenue between 33rd and 32nd Street. And it was basically, I guess, if you, could we use the term an outlaw promotion? Yeah, and he had some big plans. He brought in Andre the Giant for one of his first once. tapings. Yeah, one, but it was enough that it got Andre a deal back in WWF because they didn't want anybody else to have him. Yes, so I went to the uh, Penta or the Pen- Pennsylvania Hotel, whatever it was called, to UWF. Uh, I probably would have went anyway, but it was on the strength of seeing Cactus Jack. Hmm. And an odd thing is that... Um, Despite all the debauchery with Herb Abrams, Bruno San Martino <laughs> right. was the color commentator on some of these. Yeah, he was an early adapter into the. He was he was on board, and maybe they were using David San Martino, or maybe I might be wrong. You hit the nail on the head. They're using David San Martino, and yeah, a lot of legit guys too. You know, quote unquote legit, like Steve Williams. You know, former amateur Brian Blair, uh, Danny Spivey. All those guys had. Collegiate wrestling backgrounds might have been an easier sell for for guys. Don't forget Sunny Beach. Sunny, (laughs) how can how can you forget Sunny Beach? And uh, who was his partner? Steve Ray, right? Yeah, they they did like a a a surfer Surfer. kind of yeah uh, yeah you know a a nice uh, blonde guys. They were a little overaged, right? (laughs) To be like these hot blonde surfer boys. But uh, did you ever meet Colonel Red? Out of curiosity, I you know. Some of these documentaries, the dark side of the ring. Yeah, yeah. I've never heard of him, nor met him, or saw him. Did you? I remember seeing him, and he's. I think he's very quietly moved away from the business, which is which is fine. But yeah, he was kind of funny. He was always kind of like the. They had Lou Albano in for one taping, and then all of a sudden, Colonel Red popped up, and he was kind of felt like a knockoff. <laughs> but well, anyway, so I. That's the first time I saw Mick Foley, and. Uh, until I started going to ECW. Okay. And I was an ECW regular, and I don't know the exact timeline, but approximately when uh, Todd Gordon sold sold to uh, Paul Heyman. Mm-hmm. So about or, 94, 95. Or he got out. That's when Paul Heyman started bringing in all these 
whether it was Dean Malenko, mm -hmm. Chris Jericho, yeah. Eddie Guerrero, Rey Mysterio, besides, Scorpio. Yes. Yeah. Besides all the hardcore action, developing the stars that they had, like uh, the Dudleys. Yeah. And uh, Tommy Dreamer. Mm -hmm. And uh, Raven, who didn't, who sprouted out of thin air. He'd already been in WCW and they WWF. And Shane Douglas was a big force there. Mm -hmm. Public Enemy. Yeah. Uh, 911. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's not forget the Pitbulls. Pitbulls, Stevie Richards, Blue Meanie. Right. Yeah. Our good friend Blue Meanie. And, uh, but then they brought in, well, oh yeah, and Sabu. How could we leave oh. him out? The number one attraction on the independence at that point. Right. And it, but then the, the the icing on the cake for me was when they brought in Terry Funk yeah. and Mick Foley sort of around the same time. Mm -hmm. And they had some wild, you know, crazy barbed, you know, they wrapped themselves in completely in barbed, like just, just crazy stuff. And, uh, so uh, I was at the I was at the ECW show the night that Foley announced to the crowd that he's going to the WWF. Wow. Which got soundly booed. You know, you sold out. You yeah. sold out. And uh, history tells us. Well, the facts tell us that uh, it was a good move for Mick Foley because mm -hmm. uh, going beyond going past that. I don't know how how much you might know this. By the time he left. Um, ECW, when did the famous cage match? Well, it was against The Undertaker. It was against right? The Undertaker, about two and a half years. Right. And, you know, Foley developed all these characters. Uh, the Mick Foley character, mm -hmm. he brought back the Cactus Jack character and Mankind. Yeah, Dude Love. And Dude Love. Yeah. And uh, he was very brilliant. And um, when his book came out, uh, I mean, he was brilliant enough to be a multi-time, a multi-time multi New York Times uh, best uh, number one, number best. one, <laughs> yeah, right. So, uh, his first book, "Have a Nice Day." Yep, uh, I had read that, and uh, that's when I found out in that book, "Here We Go Again," but that he was a big music fan, mm -hmm. and one of his. Favorite favorites was Jethro Tull. Mm -hmm. So, and in that book, he tells a story about eighty four. So he might have been seventeen ish, eighteen ish, mm -hmm. and uh, Tull had played at NASA Coliseum. You know, fully lived on Long Island, but for some reason, I think he, I think he was, I think that's when he was starting to train with Dominic Danusi. Okay, possibly. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm jumping. Maybe eighty four was a little, timeline, little but, early. Yeah, timeline. Little, it's okay. But he missed that show. So what did he do? Somehow, because. It was very hard unless you were slipped the itinerary like I was. Right. Uh, magazines like Circus uh, would have list tours, but you didn't really know how accurate they were. Mm -hmm. Make a long story short, uh, Foley, two days later, maybe it was three days later, the closest show he could go to. And he didn't have a ride. Was Buffalo, New York? <laughs> oh, we're back in Buffalo. And yeah. he hitchhiked to Buffalo. <laughs> he, maybe he took a bus, but he had a hitchhike home. He didn't have the money, but he had a, You know, he was he had to see that tour. He'd seen Tull in the past, and so they would come around usually every year or every other year at the in the eighties, and so he had to go. So. I knew that he was a Tull fan. So that was, a, for me, that was an added bonus. So when I got involved in Ring of Honor, mm -hmm. and it was the original Ring of Honor management. It's about 2002, 2003. 2002, heading into 2003. Foley was doing a book signing right here in Bethlehem. Oh. Okay. There's a famous bookstore, uh, the Moravian College Bookstore? Or? Is it downtown? Like that's that? the one. Yeah, that's down. That one's downtown on on Main Street. There. Yeah, right okay. there. Okay. And uh, so I had spoken to Gabe and the other fellows. Mm -hmm. I go, well, let you, maybe I'll go down there and see if you know. I know it wouldn't be cheap, 
but maybe he could make a Ring of Honor appearance. Sure, because Eddie Guerrero had been in by then. You had already brought in Steve Carino, who had a bit of a name at that point. You were using different talent that had some names. Dusty type. Rhodes had come. Yeah. And right. I don't think Foley was, uh, I didn't really know, but I think he was not involved in WWE storyline mm -hmm. or his contractual situation. So I went down there and there was like a big line of people. I don't know, well over a hundred people. So what I did was I waited. So I was the last person online. So I wanted, I, I waited, waited, waited so that I didn't want there to be anyone behind me. So I could have a minute to speak with them, yeah. to ask them about, you know, trying to do business with Ring of Honor. Mm -hmm. And I bought a book and I had them sign it and I introduced myself. And uh, which meant nothing, of course, I, but he did know Ring of Honor. Mm -hmm. And what he said to me was, uh, what's your name? I go, Carrie. He goes, uh, Carrie, uh, that guy that owns that video company. Oh, OK. He, he's been making this was before there was any problems. Oh, big problems. OK. He's been making a lot of money selling the videotapes of the stuff that I've done in Japan yeah, and other stuff that's just been bootlegged mm -hmm. and I've never seen a dime. So uh, it's thank you for asking me, but you know, I, I'm really not interested. And uh, I'm like, mm, okay. Yeah. Well, that was that. And if for folks that might not know uh, the person you're referring to, Rob Feinstein, Ran a store at the Franklin Mills Mall. Or he had one in Lehigh Valley, too. Yeah. A little kiosk. And he would famously dub tapes. You could find pretty much anything you were looking for. One anything. Of the, one of the largest wrestling collections at, of anybody. To this day, has some strange agreement where he's allowed to sell ECW tapes without penalty. WWE, who owns the name and library, allow him to sell his fan, fan cam tapes and things like that. Uh, does the shoot interviews and so on. Uh, so this is somebody who I didn't realize that that there was animosity there even before the later incident. <laughs> yeah, you know, Foley, uh, he never saw a penny of residuals. Nobody yeah. did. Right. And uh, he just politely said, I'm not interested because of that. Wow. So I reported this news back to... to uh, Gabe and Doug and Rob, and uh, that was that. Mm -hmm. So um, following the uh, incident that happened where I became the sole owner of Ring of Honor, mm -hmm. which was approximately May of 2004, okay. um, and it was in all the wrestling of uh, the, the Meltzers and Mike Johnson's and it was reported, you know, that uh, Carrie Silken, whoever that is, is, you know, the new owner of Ring of Honor. We approached Barry Bloom, oh. who was Mick Foley's agent. OK, and I've met Barry and he was at All In and he was Jesse Ventura's agent, I, I believe. For a bit, he's a big, one of the he, big, big time agents in wrestling, right? Yeah. And and not just wrestling, isn't he an agent for quite for, a few for athletes and, and things like that? Absolutely, yeah. So we wanted to do a, uh, a sit down, sh uh, sit down shoot interview, mm -hmm. and um, this was in the summer, so a couple months had passed, mm -hmm. and uh, it was expensive. I think it was like five grand. Wow! And he agreed to do it, and we met him. Uh, near his house at a hotel uh, somewhere in Long Island. Mm -hmm. And it was myself, Gabe, and the camera guy. Uh, Gabe did the interview. And uh, I was just in the room. But uh, I, had a, I, had a, uh, I had a trick up my sleeve, uh, a, a, an ace in the hole. Okay. And once again, it was, and it, what, 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 what could it be? Now, you know a lot about Foley, and besides his wrestling and his doing children's books, yeah, what's one of his great passions? Love Santa Claus. That bingo, <laughs> bingo. Well, it had just happened that 
only weeks before, I think this might have been in late July, there was a release of the Jethro Tull Christmas album. Really? Yes. They hadn't put out an album for like three years, and they did an album with original stuff as well as some traditional stuff, God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen, which I, which Tall would do in kind of a really spiced up version and uh, all kinds of nice Christmassy things. And when the interview was over, I, 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 I said, well, let me walk you out. I appreciate you doing this, Mick. So I walked him to the elevator and I had a CD. Wow, you're smooth. I had a CD. <laughs> you are smooth. <laughs> and I was hoping he didn't, because it just had come out. Yeah. And he's like, oh, wow. He goes, oh, man. And so I'm like, here. He goes, oh, thank you. And so that was that was uh, so fortuitous. Yeah. Because shortly after that, and Mick knew that uh, there was a new management, mm -hmm. you know, he'd done this interview and he was comfortable enough to do that. We approached him about uh, coming to Ring of Honor mm -hmm. and we knew he wasn't going to wrestle. Right. And um, his, uh, let's see. Well, if we take you back to the shoot interviews, a lot of, a lot of the listeners sometimes want to hear about some of the inner workings at the time of Ring of Honor. You've been very clear that Ring of Honor was not a money-making proposition. How did the finances work on the five grand for the video? Did you expect to make it back? Did you expect it as a loss leader to draw people's attention to the website? How would something like that work in those days? Well, we started doing these to compete with uh, the former owner. Mm -hmm who's one of his specialties was these shoot interviews uh, with these uh, mainly retired wrestlers or guys who just wanted to talk. And it's behind the scenes. I think everyone who listens to us, but some people might not know. A shoot mm -hmm. interview is you're talking candidly about the business, uh, candidly about your life, and you're trying to get these road stories and these kind of things. So having a name like Mick Foley, yeah. I don't think he had done one. Okay. And at the interview, when we did the interview, I was very bored because I was more interested in the ECW and this early stuff. But Gabe was smart and he was key in on this, in on this WWF stuff, mm -hmm. even up to stuff that was done recently, okay. like, you know, 2000, 2001, two, three. But um, so... To answer your question, we figured we'd get our money back. Okay. If nothing else. Yeah. So if that interview if that interview was done for argument just to put a date on it, was like July 15th, let's say, mm -hmm. um I contacted him and uh I don't think we had to go I, I think we were able maybe I had to go through Barry Bloom once. Mm -hmm. But um he agreed to do a show and it was five grand. Wow. And I, you know, guys like uh, Jeff Schwartz and uh, Shane Hagedorn. Right. Who, who uh, we give, we'll give them a plug. Uh, uh, what's the name? Of the Honorable plug? mention. Of yeah. course, of course. <laughs> Honorable mention will be, or they, they, they're rolling their eyes right now because they would have every detail. You know, they would have every detail on this. But um, where I'm, when we had him come for the first show, which was September 11th, 2004 at the Rexplex, the only way to get money back, because he's not going to wrestle, is uh, was to do autographs. Mm -hmm. And I, here's where I'm unclear. Um, I don't think he liked doing autographs. Uh, he wanted, like, he was more into the charity like if you're going to do autographs, he mm -hmm. wants some of the money to go to charity. Okay. He wasn't big on uh, at that time. We worked out some kind of deal. Yeah. And uh, we had him come to the September 11th show. And um, maybe you could tell the listeners what even happened. Sure. Well, before we get to that, um, again, just kind of inside baseball here. 
I, there's guys that Ring of Honor fans know, Jay Lethal, CM Punk, Steve Carino, Homicide on this card. You said Mick Foley was getting, got five grand. What was a typical undercard guy getting? Like a guy, you know, Unibrow Matt Stryker, for instance. You don't have to give his exact wage, but oh, are, are we to- a hundred a hundred bucks? Okay, that was Gabe's famous line. Oh, you know, he have he have uh, thirty guys. <laughs> oh, they're only fifty dollar guys. <laughs> I go, but he got half the Russian army. <laughs> so yeah, when we're looking at this. I mean, there's- Look at, go ahead, read the card. Opening match, Jimmy Rave uh, with the embassy, who was at least four or five people, <laughs> defeated Dixie. Um, we have Jay Lethal facing uh, Matt Stryker uh, with the Unibrow, not to be confused with the teacher, Matt Stryker. Six man mayhem <laughs> with multiple managers involved. Uh, Trent Acid versus Angel Dust with Becky Bayless, Ace Steel, Cahagas, Fast Eddie, and Izzy, who had Lacey. Cahagas. I don't, I, I picture, I can picture them, but I can't quite describe them. <laughs> uh, CM Punk defeated Austin Aries. Uh, CM Punk and Steve Carino and Homicide are in the ring. Uh, then we have Danny Moff and BJ Whitmer uh, defeating Chicano, Flash Venom with Allison Danger. Oh. That's Flash Flanagan. Yes. And Chicano. So I still had, you know, <clears throat> relations. The magazine was long done, but these guys were begging to come up. Oh, okay. From Puerto Rico. Yeah. So we had uh, Flash and this Chicano kid come nice. up. Nice. Another, another two plane flights from Puerto <laughs> Rico and another 200 bucks. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, to, to New York, which probably wasn't uh, wasn't cheap. And then, you know, I'll, I'll actually skip around a little bit. Uh, Brian Danielson versus Alex Shelley. I. Uh, Samoa Joe versus Doug Williams for the uh, ROH Championship. The pure title, John Walters defeats Nigel McGuinness to retain. It's a hell of a card. Yeah, and I'd love to see John Walters back, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. And uh, we have, um, yeah, we had Moff Whitmer, Generation Next, The Embassy. So that's like a 1,000 people, even if they were at $50 a pop. Plus, <laughs> and a lot of them weren't. But the right, <laughs> and then plus Mick Foley at 5,000. But uh, Mick Foley interrupts Alice in Danger. Uh, he's very pro extreme in, in ROH. And then uh, he was very impressed with the Ring of Honor wrestling. Uh, he said if he had any, any athletic ability, he would he would use some of these great moves. Um, the Embassy and Generation Next attack Foley, but Danny Moff and BJ, our friend BJ Whitmer, make the save. Uh, says ROH is Ring of Hardcore, and that becomes important later with some of the things that Mick Foley would do in Ring of Honor. But that's a fun way. I mean, he gets involved, doesn't have to wrestle and, um, you know, get some of the younger guys. At the time, Alex Shelley's, what, 19 years old? Yeah. Coming out and, you know, attacking a guy like Mick Foley. Uh, BJ Whitmer was probably, what, 23, 22, um, if that. So it's a nice mix. You get a lot of the young guys in there and uh, ho- hoping, right, is the thought with that, with, with Gabe, do you think he's thinking I'm going to get these young guys with promising futures in the ring with a guy like Foley? Oh, absolutely. And here's the here's the thing. Yeah. We all knew, you know, uh, Gabe too, uh, and, and Sid's going carry it's five thousand dollars. <laughs> um, that to keep to, to do like a program with him, mm-hmm. meaning him coming multiple times is going to be uh, sort of impossible. Well, this was now at the point after that Rexplex show where I had developed a little bit of a rapport with him. And were we buddy-buddy? Not really, but we were able to talk some music and, and just just talk. And he really liked Ring of Honor. Yeah. And I, this is when I had his home, I had his personal number. And... We had shows coming up, you know, the the year was laid out. You know, we had shows coming up in the Midwest, mm-hmm. in Dayton, Chicago. In New uh, England. Right, in New England. And, you know, we're coming back for final battle in Philly, you know. So naturally we would want him, but we couldn't, couldn't afford him. And uh, I called him up and I told him, listen, I... 
we'd love to have you back. And um, let's just leave it like this. He liked what we were doing so much. Even though he'd only been to one show, he just liked what he saw and it reminded him of whatever is just what he likes. Mm -hmm. And uh, he gave us a really nice deal. It was one of these things. I think he won't be offended if I say this now. It was like, hey, look, Carrie, you can't tell anyone that I'm giving you this price. Right. Because it was a very, very fair price that made us made it able for us to bring him only a month later to Dayton and to Chicago. And uh, we're going to make this two parts. But why don't we finish up by uh, just talking about what transpired oh, Well, in, in Dayton and Chicago. And before I let you, <laughs> let you, let you dispense this, <laughs> Ricky Steamboat was with us. Right. You know, he was with us on and off for a number of shows. And there we are in Dayton at that fairgrounds. Beautiful facility. Yes. And uh, Bobby Cruz pooped his pants. Right. Allegedly in that facility. <laughs> right. And I, had to, and I had to guard the door for Roderick Strong, who also it was, it was a terrible place to have to poop. But anyway, uh, there's Ricky Steamboat and there's Mick Foley in the back and they're discussing this little angle that they're going to be doing and Gabe Gabe just says comes up to me he goes you know we, we were number we were across the other side of the curtain and he's, he's like look at this we got steam over <laughs> we were both you know we were both uh, uh, gobsmacked yeah. <laughs> so this is actually a good place to put a pin in it I think because okay. I got a couple follow ups so we're going to pin the conversation here and then come back to Dayton on the next episode. But I got a couple questions. Um, you took over Ring of Honor t 2003. Was it ever? Yeah, we talked a little bit about it with with Bruno. But at any idea, did you have a game plan or a business plan to start bringing in people with a little bit more of a name than, you know, at the time, CM Punk building a reputation, Brian Danison building a reputation, Steve Carino had a little national exposure, but no one with the level of Mick Foley or, or Ricky Steamboat. Was that always in the plan or did this was this just kind of a let's see what happens? It was how do you not have Ricky Steamboat and Mick Foley? OK, you know, yeah. it's like that. So um, even though we wanted to feature our own guys and our our, our own young talent uh, to bring in and sh shortly following or maybe it was in between all this was Jim Carnett with the Midnight Express. Right. So 2003. I how do you that. how do you, do, you know, who wouldn't want that? Sure. So, um, yes, it was uh it, it, it was it was a no brainer. And then to that point, um, we talked briefly about the finances. It seems very clear that this was a, a work oh. of a work of love and not because I'm doing the math in my head, Carrie, and I can't I can't even. I mean, twenty bucks an autograph times five times fifty. You're we're looking down the, the barrel of a gun there with the finances. And that's you know I, I I wasn't clear about Foley with the charity and and the autographs and that's one of the reasons he gave us the good price. He says, look, I don't want to do these autographs and charge the people. Mm -hmm. And he also knew that you know I've been in Chicago. I've been yeah. You know, there's only a limit. Right. So he was he was he was being very fair and very generous. And so was Ricky Steamboat. He was great. We'll have to talk about him also. Yeah, I think this is a good place to pause. Okay. And uh, there's a lot more with Mick Foley, including a trip to see Jethro Tull. <laughs> and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. So that's that's a pretty interesting side of Mick Foley that not a lot of people get to hear about. Even though he's written a little bit about it in his books, it'll be fun to hear about that and about the conclusion. He he scraps it up with Mick with uh, Ricky Steamboat in terms of his hardcore wrestling better than the pure wrestling and so on. I mean, it, there's one point where he's in the ring with Samoa Joe and CM Punk and looking back on that now, it's kind of an incredible moment. So we'll get to all that next week. And uh, that'll be a lot of fun, Kerry. Well, this was a fun episode and uh, we'll be... Uh 
coming at you next week with some more McFoley and uh, who knows what else. Yeah, maybe maybe some more Show World or maybe some more. Uh... Please subscribe <laughs> to Last Stop Penn Station. Please buy a shirt. Damn it, <laughs> buy a damn camel shirt or a Last Stop Penn Station shirt. I want to thank our producer AJ from Basan Creative and our good friend Eric Discover Pro Wrestling for helping us out and especially Ian for. Uh, yeah, moving this along, and uh, this is a blast. I'm having a lot of fun. I can't wait to hear more about McFoley. Uh, this is going to cross over to Thanksgiving, so we hope that you stay safe, um, that you consider limiting your travel. It, it's, mm. The virus is still contagious right now. It's going to be tough on a lot of people. Uh, small gatherings, please. I, I'm preaching to a lot of the choir here, but please be safe. Um, Zoom, Zoom works for, you know cross country you know we might we're so close to the vaccine we're so close no need to risk it now but that's my soapbox uh we want to hear more about stuff like mcfoley and show world so i will get <laughs> off it at this point so for carrie for aj for lamb chop who's with us quite a bit today thanks for listening to last stop Penn station listening to last stop penn station podcast rate review like subscribe and share on your favorite platform connect with us on facebook instagram and twitter or at laststoppennstation.com